Good evening. We welcome you to our service this evening on this World Communion Sunday, a Sunday in which we'll gather and take and share the Lord's Supper with one another as has been done throughout the world on this day. This is a special evening, an evening in which we remember and give thanks to friends both new and old who have supported Westminster College, who have been part of our community for a long time. And so I want to introduce, first of all, our speaker tonight, and I'll introduce him more in detail in a few moments. But we welcome uh, Reverend Dr. William N. Jackson, class of 57, and his wife, Vale, and their family who are here. See, Vale, I see there's part of the family. Welcome. It's great to have you here. And uh, Grove City football player, it's almost great to have you here. <laughs> He's the reason we lost yesterday. But we welcome everyone into our community, so it is great. Take a moment and greet one another. If you're seated alone, please find someone to sit with, because we don't want you to be alone in the chapel. So please greet one another. This evening, it's my honor to introduce to you our guest speaker, the William, Reverend Dr. William N. Jackson, class of 1957. Bill served churches in Canton and Boardman, Ohio, Abington, Pennsylvania, and numerous interim pastorates, just finishing one at the Hill Presbyterian Church over in Butler. He was the Dean of the Chapel here at Westminster College from 1967 to 1970. He was the Director of the Department of Religion at Chautauqua Institute from 1984 to 1989. Later on in the service, you're gonna understand why this is significant that he served here as the chaplain of the college. Following his graduation from Westminster, he earned graduate degrees in divinity and theology from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and Princeton University School of Theology. The Jacksons have been involved in Westminster College ever since they arrived here. His wife, Vail, came at the same time or a year later and eventually finished as a nursing student at the University of Pittsburgh. And so we welcome her and their family here tonight the Jacksons, as I said, have been involved in the college, and uh, Dr. Jackson served as our baccalaureate speaker in 1980 and was the Christie Memorial Lecturer in 2009. He has served on our Board of Trustees beginning in 2006. In addition to the Jacksons being here this evening, we also welcome the Scottford family, and I'll introduce them to you quickly. Uh, John and Laura Scottford are here with their family, their sons, Sam and James, and their daughters, Sydney. Uh, John's brother is here, uh, Steve, and their father, John. And they're significant to us because they have done significant things in the life of this chapel over the last couple of years, as they've helped us with providing new lighting, a new sound system, 
a recording system that allows some of your families perhaps to be able to watch this service on live stream this evening in different parts of the country. And uh, we're going to honor them in a little while as they honor Dr. Jackson and Vail uh, by giving gifts to us in their honor. And we're going to recognize them later on in the service. It is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Jackson here this evening. If you will give him a round of applause as he comes forward. The chapel is a very special place to me. We had chapel every day of the week required. Wow. Five days a week. My freshman year I sat there. My sophomore year I sat back there. My junior year there. My senior year there. Sunday night, we sang in the Vesper Choir. The console was up in the balcony. The choir was in all three balconies every Sunday night for Vespers. A very important time uh, for me as I come back to the chapel. The first of two scripture lessons tonight comes from the Gospel according to John, in the first chapter, beginning at the verse number 35. I'm going to be reading tonight from the version known as the message, it will be somewhat different from what you have in your printed bulletin. Just after Jesus was baptized, John was back at his regular post with two disciples. When Jesus came, came passing by, John looked up and said, Behold the Passover lamb, the lamb of God. The disciples, the two disciples heard this and began to follow Jesus. And Jesus looked over his shoulder and said, what, what do you want? Jesus said, come and see. And they went and stayed with him for a whole day, a whole day till late in the evening. One of the disciples was named Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. And when he heard Jesus speak for that whole day, at once when it was over, he ran and found his brother Simon and said, We have found the Messiah, the Christ. And he led his brother to Jesus. In effect, he said, Come and see. Come and see. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise the name of God. The Lord. Thank you very much. That brought back a very pleasant memory also. I told some of the folks over here I sang in the concert choir for four years here and also the College Quartet and the Vesper Choir on Sunday night. I also went to school, to class occasionally, played a little sports, and uh, graduated. Surprised a lot of people. The second scripture lesson I've chosen this evening comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning at the 31st verse. When he finally arrived, with all of his angels with him, the Son of Man took his place on his glorious throne. Then all the nations of the Lord were brought before him, <clears throat> and he sorted them out as a shepherd would sort out his flock, sheep on the right, goats on the left. And then he said, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of time. And this is why. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was homeless and you gave me shelter. I was shivering and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you comforted me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then those on the right will say, Master, <clears throat> when did we see you hungry and thirsty or <clears throat> naked and needs of clothing or <clears throat> sick or in prison and come to visit and comfort you? And then Jesus replied, I tell you the solemn truth. Inasmuch as you have done it to any of these people, 
all these things to any of these people who have been ignored and rejected and overlooked. You have done it to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40. Moyo osata, di kulanga osata. Koma pamene mwana wa mtu azabuera muole merero wate, chifukwa muna chitira ichi, mozi mwa bali wanga, ankale angono angono, muna chitira ichi ine. I think we got it. It's really nice. It's nice to have a ballet. <laughs> now, one more verse from Colossians, the first chapter, where Paul says, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Let us pray. O oh God, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I was surfing, channel surfing through the set one morning and came across, across the program called Morning Joe, hosted by Joe Scarborough, who at one time was a conservative Republican congressman from Florida. And on that program, he's supposed to be the conservative voice among the others on an otherwise very liberal network. The morning I was watching, he turned to his friends and said, uh, I'm not like the rest of you guys. I believe in smaller government and balanced budget and strong military and states' rights. But none of that to the exclusion of the people I'm concerned about who are needy and suffering, who are hungry and homeless, who are poor and elderly. For after all, I'm trying to be a Matthew 25 Christian. And they said, what was that? He said, Matthew 25, the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus said, inasmuch as you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. What Jesus was saying, said Scarborough, was when we look at the world, he wants us to take him seriously. You know, a lot of people are taking Jesus seriously. Some of the people are very dramatic in what they do. Last year, I finished a book called 42 Faith by Ed Henry. It's the story of Branch Rickey, who hired Jackie Robinson, an African-American, 61 years ago this year, to be the first African-American in professional sports. And the book is more about faith than it is about ba baseball. That's why the title is so good, 42 Faith. It talks about the foundation in this book of where they came from in their faith. Each one of these men had a God-fearing, virtuous, deeply committed, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-sharing, faithful mother. And those mothers formed the faith, foundation of faith for both of these men. And Henry says in his book, the reason that that experiment was so successful of integrating baseball and thereby affecting all the professional sports in the future was not because Branch Rickey was so innovative and creative and so disciplined or because Jackie Robinson was so talented and, and uh, skilled and competitive and had a, an incredible self-discipline and self-control but because of the faith which held them together, together with Jesus Christ, a common faith which they held together. And Ed Henry was on a television program right after I read the book, and he said to the uh, host, the reason this place, this uh, experiment was so successful was because Branch Rickey, Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson took Jesus seriously. You know, we may not have the kind of revolutionary, profound, skillful thing, creative thing that Branch Rickey had. We may not have those things. But if we take Jesus seriously, the results will be just as valid 
and just as relevant and just as real as they were for Robinson and Ricky. Just as real. In our text, two texts this evening, we're talking about places where we should be and can be the kind of people who take Jesus seriously. The gospel of Jesus Christ is always inviting, beckoning us to take Jesus seriously. The shepherds come to the, the angels come to the shepherds, the star to the magi. Come to Bethlehem. Come and see. Come and see. Holy Spirit comes to Simon and the temple and says, come every day because eventually you will see the Messiah. And one day that happened. Joseph and Mary came and Simon took the baby and said, I have seen the Messiah. Now I can die in peace. Come and see. Come and see. And this story, this story of the two disciples with John, Jesus comes by and John says, Behold the Lamb of God. And these two men follow right away. Right away. Jesus said, looking over his shoulder, what, what do you want? And they said, Where are you staying? And Jesus said, Come and see. And they came and they saw and they spent the whole day with him. James Stewart, the great Scottish theologian, was talking about this particular story in his book called Life and Teaching of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden he said, what I wouldn't give to have spent a whole day with Jesus. And I looked up from the book and I said, what I wouldn't give for a whole day spent with Jesus. And then Andrew... Simon Peter's brother, one of the two, I think the other one was John, but Simon, Andrew went to find Simon, his brother, and said, we have found the Messiah. And he led him to Jesus. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. And then Jesus says to all of us, come all you who labor and heavy laden, or heavy laden and I will give you rest. Shalom. Peace, joy, enrichment, fulfillment. Ask, seek, knock. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Come and see. Come and see. And then in that upper room, after the resurrection, Jesus holds out his hands to Thomas, points out the scars, and says, Come and see. I am truly alive. I'm the risen Christ. Come and see. Come and see. Take Jesus seriously. Come and see the truth of the incarnation. Jesus Christ is real. And you see, when we come and see, the invitation is also open to us, not just the people I've mentioned, but the invitation is open to all of us as well. Jesus is still saying to us, come and see. Come and see this Jesus. Come and see who he is. And when we come and see, we begin to see Jesus in many unsuspecting and surprising places. A friend of mine, Tom Long, introduced me to a story about a woman named Kathleen who was a public health nurse in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Asbury Park was... Uh, at one time, the rival of Atlantic City had pristine beaches and restaurants and shops and hotels. But in the 1960s, when everything fell apart in all the protests and civil rights in Vietnam, something happened. And the beach no longer was pristine. It was filled with empty syringes and empty beer cans. The boards on the walk were rotting. Most of the shops and restaurants were closed. The three hotels, two were brothels. And one was an indigent, indigent home for people, all of whom were old, most of whom were poor, and many of whom were very sick. The owner of that home didn't want the health department to come in, because that would have taken away his income from these people on SSI, all their money. The 
health department ignored it. City didn't care. But Kathleen did care. And she didn't go in as a public health nurse. She went in and was hired as a chambermaid. And she cleaned toilets. And she scrubbed floors. And she exchanged, she changed bed linen. And once in a while she would take temperature. <clears throat> take temperature and take pulse and take the blood pressure and bathe them and bandage them. And one of her friends said, how demeaning that must have been, cleaning toilets, changing bed linen, and bathing dirty people. And Kathleen said, on the contrary, in that house, in every room, on every face, I see the face of Jesus. And her friend said, where did you learn to think like that? Turns out that Kathleen's mother was a special ed teacher. She dealt with children who were damaged emotionally, spiritually, physically. And she had a motto by which she lived that she taught to her daughter Kathleen. She said this, always look beyond the damages to the images. Look beyond the damages to the images. Look beyond the damages to the face of Christ, which you can see in everybody you meet. Strong or weak, young or old. Look beyond the damages to the images. You see, Kathleen was a Matthew 25 Christian who took Jesus seriously. And sometimes that happens down deep inside, in our own hearts and minds. Annie Sullivan was that extraordinary teacher who taught Helen Keller, who was born deaf and blind, taught her how to read and write and communicate. And when she was an adult, Annie Sullivan gave her a crucifix, and she held it for a long time, Helen did, and she held it to her chest, and she rubbed it, and she held it to her face. And Anne said to her, what does that mean to you, Helen? And Helen Keller said, when I hold this crucifix, I see the face of Jesus. And he said, chuckling, Annie, you're blind. What do you mean you see the face of Jesus? And she said, in the eyes of my soul. When I take a cube of bread like this, or a plastic cup in my hand, when I rub the cross in my pocket, or I take the old family Bible and run my fingers to see where it's underlined by somebody I knew and read the notes in the margin. Once in a while when I do that, I just stop and close my eyes. And all of a sudden, from the eyes of my soul, I see the face of Jesus. And I find in that moment, I'm taking Jesus internally very seriously. And sometimes, sometimes it's, it happens that people look at us, they look at, there's an old hymn that says, uh, Christ living in me, others his beauty to see. If we are consistent and constant in our witness, sometimes people see us and they see Jesus, taking Jesus seriously by seeing who we are. Our son Jim was working in Cleveland, came out of work one day and a man said, uh, how about some money for food? Jim checked the treasury in his pocket and said, well, yes, I can help you out. But he didn't give him the money. He took him across the street and helped him order his supper. And the man said, could, could I have one of those apple pies too? Jim checked the treasury and said, yeah, yeah, you can have that. And after he ordered the meal, Jim went with him to the table and he offered to ask grace. The man accepted. And the man said, why, why didn't you buy supper? Jim said, I have to have not enough money to take the train home. And they talked for a while. Jim asked about what it was like to live on the street and where did he live and where could he get help? Just interested in what he was doing after having prayed for him a prayer of grace. And all of a sudden, the man looked up and said, do you know what God looks like? Jim says, oh, nobody knows. What God, I'm a preacher's kid. Nobody knows what God looks like. No, 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 no. You know what God looks like? He looks like you. Every time Jim and I talk about that story, he says, 
That was one of the most humbling things that ever happened to me in my life. Realizing that here I was, probably trying to live a Christian life, trying to be consistent and constant, never knowing that somebody was looking at me and taking Jesus seriously. Well, you see, we have a motive and we have a mission. The motive is that God loves us. God loved the world so much. He loves us totally. He loves us unconditionally. He loves the whole world and he loves us individually. As St. Augustine said, he loves each one of us as if there were only one of us to live, to love. He loves each one of us as if, as if there were only one of us to love. James Stewart, whom I quoted a moment ago, said, when we are embraced and engulfed by the love of God, the motivation of God's love, we begin to realize, begin to see, begin to see who Jesus really is. We begin to see what it means to be forgiven, to have received grace, our salvation, and our hope. We see the cross and resurrection for the power that it is. And when we have that motivation of love, we begin to develop the desire to share that love that motivates us with others, to follow Jesus, to love him, to serve him, to share him. That's our calling. If we take Jesus seriously, seriously, we are given the calling to share Jesus Christ. Peter says in his letter, for to this you have been called because Christ died for you. That's the motivation. Leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. That's the mission. A mission and a motive, a calling. William Sloan Coffin in his last book differentiates between a career and a calling. A career seeks to make money. A calling seeks to make a difference. A career seeks to be successful. A calling seeks to be obedient. A mission, a motive, and a mission. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Let's turn that around. As I love you, love one another. John says in his letter, we love because Christ first loved us. Turn that around. Because Christ loved us first, we love a, most, a, 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 a motive and a, a mission. Motivation and a mission. Robert Withnell, a professor of religion and uh, philosophy at Princeton University, did a study one time as to who were the most generous and compassionate, caring and kind people in the world. His first assumption was it was going to be the people who were wealthy and powerful, had prestige and power, and he found that was not true. Many did, but many of the people who gave, gave perfunctory, they gave money, but there was no compassion and care and kindness. And it wasn't really genuine. He even pointed out in his book about this that there were two very popular politicians from the last 20 years, and I will not name them, one of whom on his tax returns gave 2% to charity, and another gave nothing to charity. Prominent leaders in our country. So he said that wasn't true. So he said maybe the people who didn't have much, who had to sacrifice and had to work to make it through, maybe because of that they'd empathize and they, they would be more generous. And it turned out that wasn't true. What he discovered was that the people who were most kind and caring, most compassionate and generous, and loving were the people who had experienced that in their life, growing up or sometime in their life. Somebody loved them, somebody cared for them, somebody took care of them, and they learned what it was to do that for others. When I was pondering that, I thought of the quote from uh, Franz Kafka, that Czech novelist and philosopher who said, if you live the parable, you will become the parable. Think about that. If you live the parable, you will become the parable. If you begin to live the parable, it'll be part of your innate being. It'll be part of you deep inside within you. If you are living the parable, you will become a person of what that parable is talking about. If you live the parable, if you live the parable, when these questions and criticisms come, when 
decisions are made and questions are asked, and when you're pressured to do something for somebody else, because you're living that parable, and because you've become that parable, you will answer automatically, naturally, from deep within, spontaneously, from deep within the core of your very being. If you live, if you live the parable, you will become the parable. Jack Casey, Jack Casey was a man, an MT, EMT driver, who really fits into that category of having been blessed by someone who cared for him. When he was a very young boy, he went to have some teeth removed, and when they started to put the mask over his face to put him to sleep, he was scared to death, and he was acting very uh, scared, and so the nurse there did something she probably shouldn't have done. She got down beside him, put her arm around him, and said, I'm going to stay right with you until this is all over, and when you wake up, I'll be here. And sure enough, when he woke up, when Jack Cassidy, Casey woke up, there she was. Years later, when he was a first responder, EMT driver, he went to cover an accident where a pickup truck had wrapped itself around a tree and all the windows were broken, the windshield was out and fuel was dripping. The man was trapped inside, scared to death. And when he went up, the man was inside crying, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. And Jack Casey did something he probably shouldn't have done. He crawled through the windshield, got up beside the man, put his arm around him, and said, I'm going to stay with you till this is all taken care of. And he stayed right there to the end. The next day, Jack Casey went to see the man in the hospital. And when he walked in the room, the man on the bed looked up at Jack Casey and said, you are crazy as hell. We could have died out there. Why did you do that? And Jack Casey said, I'm a Christian. And it just seemed like the right thing to do. When you are coming to the end of your life, young people, old people, I don't care. When you come to the end of your life, the consummation of all that you do in this life, the end of your witness, the end of your your ministry, when you come to the very end and you begin to look back, looking back at the people you loved, people who were lovable and the people who were not so lovable that you loved, people to whom you offered grace and forgiveness, the ones who deserved it and didn't expect it, the ones who expected it and didn't deserve it. When you look back at the times when you've been on a mission trip or worked in an urban ministry or, on, or volunteer on a college campus or in your home church, or calling on shut-ins and providing food and clothing for people in need, when you look back at times when you helped a stranger, when you look back at the times when, times when people have anchored you, and sometimes they've admired you, sometimes they've defied you, and sometimes they defended you, sometimes they complimented you, and sometimes they criticized you. When you look back and see that, when you look back and realize that there were times when you not only gave your coat, you gave your cloak as well. Times when you went the second mile. The times when you turned the other cheek. When you look back at the end of your days and see all of this, I hope you'll be able to say, looking back, I was a Matthew 25 Christian. I took Jesus seriously. And whatever I did or said in the name of Christ, it just seemed like the right thing to do. Let us pray. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus. You can have all this world. You can have all this world. 
You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wow. Let us respond to the message of this evening by standing and singing together, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. And it is actually hymn number 142. 142. been proclaimed, and we have been invited to come to this table, the Lord's table, to come and to take this bread and to drink of this cup, knowing that this table does not discriminate. This table brings all who believe and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior to come and be a part of this festive meal. The night in which our Savior was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. Luke tells us when he was at table with them, he broke bread. And when he did so, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Night he took the bread and said, this, this is my body, broken for you. Take this bread, take it seriously. Take this bread. My body, broken for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. In the same way, the Lord took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, to remember of me, remembrance of me. Do it as often as you do it, seriously. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come again. This evening, we want to give thanks to the Scottford family for uh, the wonderful gifts that you've made to us. But the gifts come not just as a gift to us, but a gift that honors Bill and Vale. And so, Vale, I don't know if you can get out of your seat, but if you would come up so we can see who you are as well, we'd like to do that. So the renovations in the chapel have been given in honor of Bill and Vale for their years of dedicated service to Westminster, but also their years of love and friendship with the Scottford family. And so we're grateful to them. And John is going to share with you just a little bit of that. But first, let me read what's on this wonderful uh, plaque that we have here. Wallace Chapel Renovations 2018, in honor of Reverend Dr. William N. Jackson, class of 57, college chaplain, 1969 to 1970, and Mrs. Vale Watson Jackson, made possible by the generosity of the Scottford family. And this will hang back in the narthex. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. John, you want to come up? Thank you for the kind introduction, Pastor Moore. I was told to keep my remarks brief, 
and will do my best to honor that request. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm excited to be here tonight, not only to participate in this chapel service, but to honor Reverend Jackson and his wife for their years of faithful service to Westminster College, as well as for their leading of others to Christ and modeling the fruit of the Spirit. Joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As previously mentioned, Reverend Jackson is an alumnus of Westminster College. I will share repeating his graduating year, but let's just say that Old Main was just called Maine when he trod the grounds of Mother Fair. It was here that he spied a certain redhead who would later become his wife for what is now over 50 years. The Jacksons have two children, Anne and Jim, and five grandchildren. Anne, too, is an alumna of Westminster College. The connection between the Jacksons and the Scottfords goes back many years. We have what I call a shared history, dating back to when Reverend Jackson answered the call in 1970 to be the senior pastor at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Boardman, Ohio, and found sitting in one of the pews, the Scottford family. My parents, John and Judy, along with my younger brother, Steve, and me. My parents and the Jacksons bonded quickly, becoming fast friends. We all grew in the Lord and I came to a personal relationship with Christ while on a church work camp in Kentucky. I have many fond memories of those days, whether it was going to lunch together after church, potluck suppers in the fellowship hall, family camp at Camp Fairfield outside Ligonier, listening to speakers together at the Christian Missionary Conference on those oh-so-hot summer Sunday afternoons right here at Westminster College. And finally, those Fourths of July at the Jackson's house on Lake Chautauqua. Our friendship is such that when we get together, we just pick up where we left off as if no time has passed at all. You can now see how easy it was for me to heed the leading of the Holy Spirit and call Mrs. Jackson a few months ago to ask permission to honor Reverend and Mrs. Jackson through our gift to Westminster College for needed items at Wallace Chapel. When Mrs. Jackson called back to enthous enthusiastically approve my request, she related me to me the following events of which I did not know. When Westminster Presbyterian Church began its search for a new senior pastor, a committee was formed of church members to find and recommend a candidate for final ratification by all the members of the church. It was that time in the process when members of the committee were going to hear one of the final candidates preach and asked my parents, who were not members of the committee, to come along. And so it came to pass that the first time my parents ever met Reverend and Mrs. Jackson was right here at Wallace Chapel. I don't know what you would call what Mrs. Jackson revealed to me, but I would call it a God thing. God graciously affirmed to me what I knew in my heart was right and true in honoring the Jacksons. It isn't every day that I get to see in a mirror clearly. But when I do, I can only stand back and awe my Creator. Thank you very much.
John and Laura and family, we want to thank you so much for your gift. And I feel like I'm not giving you a big enough gift, but other than to say thank you. Uh, and if you come in a few weeks, you'll see some new pulpit chairs that have been on back order for months. And uh, they must be making each one individually, which we'll take that. And some other renovations. And so we thank you all uh, for your gifts. And for the Scottfords, again, let's say thank you. as we get ready to go out in peace to rejoice and give thanks for this day may you recognize Jesus may you allow Jesus to come into your lives may you exemplify who Jesus is when someone looks at you and says man that guy's a little different what is it about her that I want to follow may the Lord bless you and keep you amen the choir is going to come up and sing and then we're going to leave and we're going to have some nice refreshments on the way out the door so Again, thank you all for being here. Thanks for sticking with us. I know some of you need to be somewhere else at this moment, but they'll wait on you. And if you need a, a pass, let them know I'll write it for you. Okay? I invite the choir to come up.